Okay, everyone, we are going to come to order, and I am not, we don't have technical difficulties. This microphone is for a recording. It's not for amplification, so I'm going to use my big boy outdoor voice, as we all will as we do this presentation. But I'd like to, to thank everyone for coming tonight. This is a, a wonderful turnout, and I was looking at the sign-in sheets and saw that we have representation, not surprisingly, mostly from uh, 22204, so the Columbia Pike area, but I also saw zip codes re representing the Metro East section of Arlington. I saw a North Arlington zip code, a Crystal City, Pentagon City area zip code, also Central uh, North Arlington and the Boston Westover area. So we truly are convening a lot of people for this artist talk with uh, Donald Lipsky. And I, am, uh, I want to share a little bit about why I'm here. I'm Christian Dorsey. I, I serve as one of your five members of the county board, but I'm not really here in that capacity. I'm here because I live very close to the uh, subject site for the uh, art installation that we're going to be talking about on the western end of Columbia Pike. And uh, I am very uh, interested in having and uh, being a part of a community conversation about what is uh, a very unique piece of art and a unique opportunity for us to hear from the artist. By way of a little bit of background, Arlington is home to more than 60 permanent public art projects. And we come by these projects in a variety of ways. Uh, some of them are, you know, these are commissioned to be integrated into various capital projects, as is the case with this one. It's part of a larger, what we call a multimodal project, looking at realigning transportation and, and putting in some infrastructure on the western end of Columbia Pike. It also comes through the private development process, where even though developers are pursuing the redevelopment of private spaces, we as a fundamental uh, tenant of Arlington, a fundamental baseline of participation, require that that private development create some public spaces, and public art is a central component of that. We also have various other processes of development whereby we achieve the goal of uh, realizing public art, and it also happens through the uh, commissioning of work directly by members of our community. Now, for this project, in 2013, Donald Lipsky was selected uh, to create a, a piece of public art for our western gateway, our southwestern gateway. So uh, to orient you, if you go all the way to the western end of Columbia Pike, where it meets Jefferson Street, that is the subject area. Right across, of course, is Fairfax County. And this project, like I said, is just a few blocks from where I live, and it will be something that will be seen by uh, presently, primarily motorists or people riding in buses as they come into Fairfax, or as Arlingtonians leave the county going to the southwest. So it's a very prominent place, one that is extremely important and serves as a central uh, place of identity or could serve as a central place of identity for South Arlingtonians. Now, this is something I'd like to just say generally about art. It is inherently subjective, as we all know. Different people look at it in very different ways. By virtue of getting ready for tonight, I was doing a little research into, into the way artists that we venerate today were viewed by their contemporaries, and was somewhat surprised to learn that the likes of Gauguin, Rodin, uh, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, Monet, these were people who we venerate today, but were derided, unappreciated, or not popular during their time. Now, only time will tell whether or not Donald Lipsky is viewed in the same regard as those venerated artists, but he is something a little bit different than that. He is a noted public artist, and as part of that, uh, his work is designed to really react to and interface with the community. So tonight, we have a great opportunity to hear directly from him about the inspiration for, for, for his work, uh, the thinking that went into it and how he expects us as the public to understand, appreciate, and interact with it. But before we hear from Donald, I am going to turn it over to Arlington's Director of Public Art, Angela Adams, who is going to tell us a little bit more about the process for uh, commissioning public art in Arlington, and she will then in turn formally introduce Donald Lipsky. Angela. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Dorsey, and for your support of this project and for agreeing to moderate this evening. I want to also thank our partner in libraries uh, for helping us present this uh, opportunity to this evening. And I also want to just point your uh, attention to some other programs we're going to be doing right here um, in the libraries. Uh, Cultural Affairs, the um, agency I work for, does more than public art. We present all sorts of art uh, to the public, most of it for free. And we'll be doing a First Friday's Groovin' on the Pike series, which is a music and dance program right here in the library starting in October, November, and December of this year. Um, I also want to say we do do uh, artist talks from time to time. This week we're doing two. So we have tonight, um, and if you aren't sick of artist talks by the end of this evening, we invite you to come to hear um, artists from Spain come and speak about their project uh, in the courthouse neighborhood at 11 o'clock on the Saturday. Uh, we also have a closing party that's all uh, announced there towards the end of uh, October. Um, so uh, I want to also thank some other folks who are here today um, who were integral, uh, a very um, uh, necessary part of our, of our process, and that is the Artist Advisory Panel. So um, Christian asked me to talk a little bit about how we go about commissioning public art, and what I will say is that the public art program is this year 33 years old. We started as a developer-initiated program. The county board uh, passed a policy for public art in 2000 that manda mandated us to create a public art master plan, which we did in 2004, and we're in the process of updating now. So we ask you, if you have any interest at all in participating in that, please let me know, or Deirdre know, and we'll let you know the opportunities for engaging in that. But that will be going to our commissions uh, slowly over the next couple of months, um, and we're looking to update that hopefully with the new board uh, next year, early next year. Uh, so as part of our program, as Christian mentioned, we have s projects that come through private development. We have projects that come as part of county uh, initiated projects, be they new buildings, open space, or infrastructure. Um, and then we also have community initiated projects. Uh, we have some folks who um, are working with us to do uh, some murals, especially down in the Formal Run Valley area currently. So we act as in an advisory capacity when, when there's interest there. Um, so uh, when we, the county, thinks about commissioning a new work of art, it's generally tied to a capital project. We don't run out and build 30 foot, 40 foot up art on our own typically. It's integrated into some larger capital project. In this case, it's the Western uh, Gateway Multimodal Project, which is at the intersection, as Christian mentioned, of Jefferson Street and, and Columbia Pike. So when the community decided that they wanted, and this goes back to the form-based code, those of you who are around for that, and folks who wanted to mark that Western Gateway with something special. Uh, it was thought back then to do public art. And so when the time came around to do a capital improvement um, streetscape project in that area, that's when we remembered that you all asked for public art and we picked up uh, the theme and, and worked with that capital project to plan for the art. So we did a, a national search. Somebody reminded me we had 22 folks who were finalists for the project. We um, brought together an art advisory panel and these are the folks I wanted to acknowledge. Um, we have Inta Malice who participated, uh, Adriana Torres who's here this evening, uh, Lily Mancia, I don't know if she's here t tonight or not. Um, uh, Tom Ashcraft, who is our outside uh, arts professional, Takis Carantanis, who's here. Uh, and also we had staff member uh, Bill Roberts and Mike Garcia from the Fairfax, actually, side of things, because we were right on the line there and wanted to work uh, in a cooperative fashion with Fairfax. Um, so this group of folks helped us review uh, the 22 our, our folks who applied for this project and then narrowed it down to Donald Lipsky, who we then invited to uh, be to commission the project. Uh, the, Donald then went through a, a concept stage, but before that happened, he came and he visited and met many of you, did a lot of research along Columbia Pike, um, and came up with a concept, which he's gonna tell you about tonight, in the context of his work. So you understand a little bit more about Donald, 
the, the, the proposal for um, Columbia Pike and also how, how Donald thinks, how he comes up with these, with these ideas. But it was uh, working with this artist advisory panel that we made this uh, decision to work with Donald and to go with this concept. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will introduce uh, Donald Lipsky. Um, I will say that our collection features uh, as many local artists as it does uh, well-known uh, artists from elsewhere. And of course, Donald falls in that camp. Um, Donald is originally from Chicago. He's the son and grandson of bicycle dealers. He was a history major and anti-war activist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He first discovered ceramics while working with ceramics legend Don Wrights and pursued an MFA in ceramics at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Um, in the 1970s, Donald moved to New York, gained recognition with his installation Gathering Dust, which first appeared at Artist Space in 1978 and then moved to the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, Donald is a three-time National Endowment for the Arts grantee. He became a Guggenheim Fellow in 1988. He was honored by awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Rome Prize of the American Academy in Rome, and Cranbrook's Distinguished Alumni Award. Donald's work is in the permanent collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the former Corcoran Gallery of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Manil Collection, and dozens of other museums. In recent years, his work has focused on um, creating large-scale works for public places, and some of the most recognizable of these can be found uh, outside of the Denver Public Library. Um, and uh, one uh, particular favorite of mine, uh, um, is in the Grand Central uh, Market of the Grand Central Terminal in New York City, Shirshasana, um, and then fish at the uh, San Antonio River Walk. Uh, also, for those of you familiar with the uh, Convention Center in D.C. and the collection, fine collection that they have there of public art, he did a piece called Five Easy Pieces, which is great fun, and I encourage you to go visit it if you don't know it. Uh, so Donald will now tell us more about his work and how he arrived uh, working with the community for the concept for Western Gateway. I'm mic'd, so oh, mic'd. I don't no, need don't this, need right? Excellent, you're good, okay. Okay, thank you, Angela. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, it's, it's great to be here uh, talking to you all, all of you. Um, the hardest thing for me is uh, talking loud enough for all you to hear while I'm in a library because it seems like I ought to be, you know, that's, uh, my sister's a librarian. I love libraries. I've done some pieces for libraries uh, and it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I've made a few visits to Arlington and, you know, while you're a, a complex community and I don't begin to really know about you, Everything that I've seen in Arlington, I've loved. I think you're a, a great, great town. Um, I was just saying to Angela, for a town this size, a couple hundred thousand people, you have so much public art. It's astounding. Uh, you might have more public art per person than any place in the world. Uh, so, um, I think I've got... Yeah, there we No, I could do it. All right. Thank you. Let's see how this works. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, most of my career, I'm 70, so I've been doing art for a long time. Uh, most of my career, I was making work for, uh, for galleries and museums and that sort of thing. And the last couple decades, I've really turned my attention to making art for the public because I like the idea of having the whole world for an audience rather than just people who are going to galleries and museums. Uh, this is not my work. Uh, this is Marcel Duchamp, who was a, a great influential artist uh, from the early part of the 20th century. He was French, although he became an immigrant and moved to New York later in his life. Uh, one of the things he is known for 
is he would just take an object and plunk it down and say, this is art. And this had a big effect on me. Um, I was doing this sort of thing before I knew of him, but when I went to art school, I started to learn about him. At any rate, this was a bottle drying rack that he took and he said, this is art, and he signed his name on it in like 1912 or something. Um, I was down in Texas and in an antique shop, I saw a bottle rack like his and I took it to a saddle maker and had him cover it in hand stitched leather. And so that's, that's that. Um, during my career, a lot of what I've done is working with objects, just taking objects that, uh, that had some resonance for me and putting my spin on them and trying to make them uh, in, into artworks. Uh, this bed is filled with candles. Uh, there's a $20 bill I erased parts of. Um, this is the piece I, I did at the Corcoran. It's two American flags that intersect, uh, that uh, are made out of silk chiffon and then were over dyed with black. So it had sort of a somber feel to it. Uh, the Corcoran owns this um, and after 9-11 they reinstalled it, uh, which was moving for me. Uh, this is the piece at the DC Convention Center. Um, my father being a, a bike dealer, when I went to convention centers as a kid, it was uh, to the bike show, to the sporting goods show, to the toy show. It was all about fun. Uh, so asked to make a piece at the convention center, I made pieces out of what for me were, uh, were things of joy, you know, like bicycles and guitars, uh, kayaks, uh, tennis rackets, bar stools. Uh, this is probably uh, the biggest found object that I've made into a sculpture. It's a GMC bus from the 60s uh, that I cut up and put back together so it tapered towards the end and it's at a bus terminal in uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, these are like civic clocks, like would be in a town square, uh, that I put these three clocks together for a bus terminal in uh, El Monte, California, which is the farthest west, the farthest east reach of the LA uh, metro bus system. This is at a, a library in San Diego. They have a big auditorium, even bigger than this one. Um, and I, I lined the, the wall with books. It's pretty straight ahead. So thinking about what to do here uh, at the pike, I started with the idea of a pike. Uh, a pike is a medieval weapon that's on the end of a, a long pole. I don't think they're, they've been used as weapons for a long time, uh, but they're still used ceremonially. Like here, uh, the, the Pope's Swiss Guard carries pikes. And even these ones with fancier stuff going on, uh, they call pikes. Uh, they use pikes uh, as, as flagpoles and put finials on the top of flagpoles like a pike. Pikes are tools that all sorts of people use in different uh, walks of life and that they call pikes. These are loggers, uh, firemen, uh, 
fishermen, boaters, uh, a lot of people use pikes. But the pike I'm talking about here is this. In olden days, when they had a toll road, they, they would put a pike, one of these weapons, down across the road to block traffic, and then after you pay your toll, they would lift it up. And this is why toll roads are called pikes. This is where it all comes from. Um, this is the Columbia Pike uh, back in the 20s. The Columbia Pike started by Congress decided in 1810 that they should really improve the roads that come into DC. And they gave money for a few different roads, the pike going uh, to, the, to the west and to the southwest. And this picture is in, in the 20s. Before, before 1810, it was just a cow path. And they made it into a respectable dirt road. Uh, it wasn't until the 1920s that they actually paved it. And here it is zoomed in on it, and you can see uh, the, the pole that would become uh, the pike, what they would lay across. Uh, part of my feeling was uh, that on the east, you have Ingo Fried's beautiful uh, Air Force Memorial, and there should be something on the west that is vertical. And this went along with the thinking of all the people I was talking to when, when we were first talking about this piece. They wanted something that was really visible, that gave a sense of, of place, uh, that would sort of mark your entry into Arlington. Um, and so I felt something really vertical was needed, and I thought about the idea of a pike. So that's where it all started. This is a sculpture I made at uh, a ballpark in Goodyear, Arizona, which is where the, uh, the Cleveland Indians do their spring training, which the Cleveland Indians just came off a 22-game winning streak, which is spectacular. Uh, um, it's, it's, this is patterned on, uh, well, you could sort of get the idea, uh, Brancusi's great work called Bird in Space. He made about a dozen of these. Uh, and he had said that he, would want, he wanted to make a really big one. Um, this is carved of marble and sitting on a, a little pedestal. Uh, so I made more or less a copy of that, uh, except I put stitches in it like a baseball. Driving around at various times, I've come across a wind turbine blade that's being moved from one place to another. And I've been overcome by not only how similar they are to Brancusi's burden space, but how beautiful they are as shapes. Uh, and it, to me, it's amazing that this was not made by an artist who's thinking about what something looks like. It's made by engineers, and it's all governed by the laws of physics. What's going to catch the wind the best? So they're such beautiful shapes. And they're, they're coming uh, totally out of mathematics. And I love that. Um, wind turbines are, we're going to be seeing more and more of them. Um, they're, they're completely a uh, renewable source of power. They're completely non-polluting. Um, they, uh, if we're going to save our planet, uh, they're going to be part of the solution. And I love uh, referring to that. Uh, this, this little chart shows, this is the year 2001, and this is how uh, 
wind energy capacity has increased in the United States in just that time. And it's, it's going up, 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 up. Um, Virginia has a long history in wind power. This is uh, 1621. The first windmill in the United States was made, uh, was put up near, Vir near Richmond. Uh, and this uh, marks, marks that. Um, this is a windmill in Yorktown uh, in 1780. This is a picture of uh, Washington's uh, accepting the British surrender. And you see the windmill there. Uh, There's a map I came across from the Civil War, ag again uh, by Yorktown. And you can see they've drawn in these windmills uh, for people to help navigate by. If you, if you drive west on the pike, you've probably seen this. You know where it is better than me. But these are old uh, steel windmills uh, used for pumping water. Uh, when, you, when you drive out into the Midwest, you see them all over the place because they're still used. Uh, so I thought it was interesting that there are still windmills along the pike. Um, I don't mean this to, to turn this from an art talk into uh, like an alternative energy talk. But since I'm making it out of a wind turbine blade, I have to just tell you a little bit. This, this is uh, wind power in the country. And you can see Texas is really totally killing it. Uh, Virginia, not so much. The darker colors here have, have more wind power. Uh, the white ones haven't really caught on yet. Uh, but this is, this is all changing, and it's going to change fast. Uh, this is capacity for wind power in Virginia. And the, the dark blue places could support 400 big wind turbines per kilometer. Even the light blue spaces can support 100 big wind turbines per kilometer. And so this is all going to happen. The, uh, this is out uh, near uh, Roanoke. They, they just uh, approved plans for putting in the first big wind farm in Virginia. Um, in 2015, Virginia was the first state that got permits to put wind turbines offshore in public lands. And, um, they didn't do it then, and Rhode Island beat them, you know. Uh, but um, Dominion is just putting up its first two offshore uh, wind turbines. And uh, I think they're off of Virginia Beach. And eventually, there are going to be hundreds of them. And they'll be a big part of the energy power uh, for uh, Virginia. So, here is what we're building here. Um, it's simply a wind turbine blade that's up on, on a pedestal. And it's just put up as this big, beautiful thing. It's a, it's a found object. It's recycled. Uh, it's emblematic of wind energy. Uh, it's emblematic of a pike, but one that's vertical, one that's in the open position that just says, come on in. You know, everybody's welcome. You don't have to pay a toll, even though it used to be a pike. Um, it'll, it'll be beautifully lit so that it's a, a presence uh, 24 hours a day. Um, 
these are just a, a few uh, quick drawings to show what it might look like uh, from different directions. We've got this blade. Uh, as Angela said, this project started, um, I believe it started in 2012. So it's been five years. I found this beautiful blade that's 50 feet long. It'll go on a stand that's another 10 feet. So it's going to be like as tall as a six story building. Uh, so we've been storing this out in Colorado. Um, to hold it up is uh, a sort of an engineering feat. You think about it, a, a wind turbine blade is made to catch as much wind as it possibly can. So if it can't move and it's just going to be stable, it really needs some serious mechanism to hold it down. Uh, so taking a cue from the, the sort, this sort of structure where you have a pipe and then you have these uh, steel gussets that hold it up uh, that are used on high mast light towers and, and that sort of thing. Um, that's more or less what, I've, what I'm doing, but I've taken those gussets and made them into a really beautiful, graceful shape. Um, and then I'm putting it on a, pe on a pedestal. Uh, the idea is it, it does so many things. One is it, it lifts it off the ground and uh, just takes it out of, our, out of the realm of uh, the normal plane of where we exist and puts it someplace else, as one does with a sculpture. Uh, but practically, uh, they, you don't have to worry about the sculpture getting destroyed when they're shoveling snow away. Uh, it gives a place for uh, people as they're crossing the street there to sit down or rest their, their packages or so forth. Uh, and it also makes an enclosure uh, to hold the lights that are going to light this thing. I guess about 50 years ago, Arlington started to become a, uh, a haven for immigrants from all over the world. Uh, I know this is well documented in, uh, by this group uh, of wonderful photographers, the Columbia Pike Documentary Project, which started maybe 15 years ago. And there are people here from all over the world. Uh, and it's really become a multicultural melting pot. Uh, and I, I wanted to reflect this somehow in, in the work. Uh, I've, I've read places where they called the pike uh, the world in a zip code, which I love that. So in some of my other projects, I've found a way to, uh, to involve the community. There's a piece I did in Fort Worth, Texas that's made out of cowboy hats. And all the hats in the sculpture were given to the project by people of Fort Worth. And trying to get a, a cowboy to give you his hat <laughs> is, is not an, I, I ended up calling the piece intimate apparel. Um, uh, but there's 500 stories there, and I've heard a lot of them, and they're all great. Uh, this is a piece I did at the library in uh, Minneapolis. They have a fireplace on the arts and music floor, and they asked me to make something to go above the fireplace. I made this sculpture out of violins, and I got all the kids who were in the violin programs in Minneapolis uh, to come and carve their names into the violins. 
And I can imagine that they're going to come back and show their kids, you know, see, I wrote, I carved Charlie right into the violin. Uh, so thinking about what to do here, I went back to the idea that it's a pike and they used to charge toll. Uh, 20 sheep cost 20 cents. You know, a mule and rider, 12 and a half cents. You know, and so on and so forth. A carriage with four horses, 40 cents. Well, that guy could probably afford it, a four horse carriage. Uh, and I thought that we would cover the base with coins and that the citizens of Arlington would go rummage around in their drawers and find coins from their home country and give me those coins and I would build them into the sculpture. Um, so they'll be uh, epoxied in, they'll, we'll do our very best to make it vandal proof so that someone can't pry the coins off, although it would probably be a lot of work for coins that are not going to be worth that much money. Uh, I've worked in this way in various ways over the years. Uh, this with little bingo markers. Uh, this was uh, with nickels. Uh, that's, that's my son who's going to be 26 in March. So this this is a, a while ago. Uh, this bench I made for the Central Park Conservancy in New York who auctioned it off uh, to make money uh, to support the conservancy. And it's covered with uh, old tokens from the, from the New York subway. It's my old mayor. Uh, these are ocean mooring buoys that are covered with pennies that were corroded as if they had been in salt water. Uh, this picture's at, at the White House. Uh, during the Clinton administration, they had sculpture on the White House lawn. Um, so one of the things I thought is, I'm going to make a coin that might look something like this, and if people give me some coins from their country, I'm going to give this coin to them in exchange. So that's what's coming. Uh, I'm not sure when. Uh, this, this all started in relationship to the, uh, the public transportation you were going to get here that doesn't seem to be coming, which I think is a big disappointment. Um, and then the process has drawn out. Uh, but I think that next year uh, this will become a, a reality. So I'm excited about it and it's, it's great to have a chance to tell you where it came from and what I've been thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. So uh, before we get to the audience, just a couple of uh, baseline questions about your process, if you would. Uh, can you just share some of the some of the the lessons you gleaned, some of the observations that you got from talking to people in Columbia Pike, where you sort of did your your research, talking to the people of the community? Can you share a little bit about what what they wanted to to see, or how they they viewed this area, and how it informed your process? Okay, um, the, the strongest thing I got from talking to people uh, about Arlington and about the Pike was the, the sense that there are people from all over the world here, which is, is so unique. Uh, you know, I live in New York City where there's people from all over the world. Uh, but to have the concentration uh, that you have here, 
I understand that uh, a quarter of the people in Arlington speak a foreign language at home. That's, a, that's astounding. Um, and it's, it's special. And it's not without problems. Uh, but it's something I think should be celebrated. Uh, the other things I got were that this is, uh, is really, um, they wanted a declarative boundary. This is, you are now entering Arlington, and this is some, someplace special, and it should be something that holds the space that really makes a statement, uh, all of which led me to the verticality of the piece. Um, and then it, then it was just the, uh, the idea of a pike. And when, for me, that was sort of an aha moment when I thought, oh, a, a pike is like this, and then you put it up like this, and it's open and it's welcoming. Uh, and that's how the town felt to me. And that's, that's what led me here. And so for everyone who is here tonight, everybody who watches on Arlington TV, they'll be able to get a sense of that thought process. Does your design include the ability for some sort of uh, an interpretation or a description of some of your vision so that future generations or others who don't have benefit from this conversation can, can glean some of these insights? Yeah, probably no. But they, they could go back and see this videotape. Um, but, you know, Picasso, and in this sense, I'm just like Picasso. Yeah, he said, whatever anybody sees in my work, it's there. Uh, and I, I think, OK, people might not know what a pike means, you know, or um, that, that this is a sign of welcoming because it's like this instead of like this. But I, I think that the piece will just stand on its own, and people will see in it what they see in it. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful shape. It does refer to this wonderful idea of making energy that doesn't pollute the world. Uh, and it'll, it'll just be there, and it'll be beautiful. Um, uh, Takas was saying before that, you know, basically, people are going to be speeding by this in their cars. You know, I was hoping they'd be speeding by it on a trolley, you know, but um, some people will be walking across the street here. Some people will be riding their bicycles on it. Those people who are the, the slow-moving people will be the people who see the coins. Maybe people who gave coins for the piece will make a pilgrimage and come here and park the car and get out and walk and sit on it and look and see if they could find the coins they bought, you know, and, and have, a, have a sense of participation, have a sense of ownership. Um, really understand that the citizens of Arlington are part of the piece. Um, and that, that, I think, will be evident without any signage saying, uh, Donald Lipsky wanted you to blah, blah, blah. Um, um, I was going to say, uh, Takis was talking about how what's, a lot of what's undecided is what's going to happen around here. Is there going to be some landscaping? Is it going to develop into a little plaza? Will it uh, perhaps be a place that's actually a center of something? rather than just something that you drive by at 40 miles an hour in your car. I don't know, but I hope so. Now, you had engineers look at it in terms of a base. Have you also had engineers look at the wind turbine blade itself? Because it's obviously made to move with the wind and not stand up to it. So I know even when 
they shut the blades off because the wind's too strong, they still can turn it so it has the least amount of wind resistance on it then. So. Right. Uh, I've, I've, it's a very good question and I pose the exact same question to my engineers. And they are confident that it'll be fine. Um, I, I, have a, a, I have a piece that I did in Houston that I've been worried about this last week. I'm doing a piece in Virginia Beach that's going to be on the Lesnar Bridge where, that, has, that has a whole lot of surface area uh, that I'm concerned about how that's going to do in a hurricane. Um, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I, I hire people who I think are good, responsible engineers and assume that they know what they're talking about. And they put their stamp on the piece of paper and I, I assume that it's, it's going to be fine. I know that this needs a whole hell of a lot of concrete. All right, so we're yeah. going to, I think, have maybe Angela also talk about what we do in terms of indemnifying or, or, you know, foreseeing incidences and how they may be remediated. But I'd like to add to that question, if I could, uh, in addition to the turbine blade, you also have the base of coins, which presumably, even if they're coated in epoxy, are going to shine and reflect light. And how do you envision that impacting the experience of, of pedestrians and motorists? Oh. Uh, I don't think that'll have any impact at all. Uh, they, they won't be any shinier than a, a light post uh, would be. And the, the fact is, I've made, I made a, a sculpture in El Paso last year that's, uh, that's a, a cloud made of stainless steel panels. Uh, and there has, and it's at a roundabout, so people really have to be paying attention, and it, it hasn't been any problem at all. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's a problem. So I'll just say the other thing about public art is, public art is the art of compromise. The, the, no artist gets to just go out and do whatever they want. Um, there's a lot of give and take, and one of the reasons why one of the reasons why, many reasons, is that it's in the public domain. So it has to be safe. It has to be durable. We have to be getting our money's worth. And so, as I said, when we are guests on the teams of these larger projects, we have a whole slew of engineers who happen to be our colleagues who look at projects like this. Traffic engineers, people who do uh, ISD inspections for, for any, kind of, any kind of structure. Um, and we have... Uh, Basically, it has to pass muster with our technical advisory team who are basically building this larger project. So anything that they ask us to do, and we ask in some cases Donald to do, to, to indemnify, to secure, to make sure that this project is safe, we, we do, we comply with. Um, so that's the good news about public art, is it's, it's done with lots of checks and balances. I think maybe on the downside is it takes a really long time to realize these things, and they're often fairly large budgets too, because I don't know that the artists are getting wealthy on these budgets, but there are a lot of people involved in the team to realize these projects. So that's, that's, that's part of the nature of the work. Uh, for, for me, I would just say to that, you know, the, the reason I started doing public art, I started, I, I initially started it because I wanted to make big things. And if you just make big, something big as a sculptor, then you have to store it, you know. But <laughs> making big public art, you know, the, you've got a client and a place for it to go before you make it. So that's, I think, what first got me uh, hooked on it. But the, the things about it that I really like are one thing I like about it is that it's hard. And it's hard because of all the things Angela was referring to. Uh, it's, it, when I, in the days when I was just making things to show in a gallery, 
I'd be in my studio and I could just do whatever I want. And if somebody's interested in it, great. If they're not, that's great too. Here, you've got to really consider the site. You've got to consider the culture of where it's going. You've got to consider everything. You've got to work with all sorts of people. And I love that. I, I love that it's hard. Um, because it, it challenges me every day. It makes me dig deep. Uh, and, and the other thing I love about it is it matters. Uh, they, these things really have the, uh, the ability to become uh, landmarks, to become touchstones for their communities, to be, become something that are, are, are sources of pride. Uh, if you make something that's in a museum, great. People who go to a museum see it. Here, people integrate it into their everyday life. They become something that they pass all the time. Uh, they might start, you know, just take it for granted or not, not even notice it. But to me, being part of somebody's actual world uh, is an important and a wonderful thing. It almost sounded like a wonderful concluding statement, but I think we have more questions if that's oh, okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm fairly familiar with the intersection uh, where this will be installed, and I'm just wondering, it sounds like the logistics are still fairly fluid. Do you know whether you intend to install this piece uh, um, in the island that is in the middle of the intersection? or do you uh, envision going either to the, the north or, or south of the pike itself? Uh, let me just picture this. That's west uh, to the north. No, to the south. south. We're north of to the, the, the south. Right. Yeah, we're north of the it, it will not be on the island. It'll be uh, on, the, on the south. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seemed that there was going to be, the that that was going, itself going to be an island that there was going to be one lane that went to the south of it and then the, the bulk of the street to the north of it. Is that correct? I Okay, and that, yeah, that, I guess that kind of answers my question. I was wondering uh, uh, that there was going to be some modicum of park space to ag accommodate people approaching this piece and appreciating the piece. Uh, and uh, if you've surveyed the site and seen, there's already kind of a small community, including a taco truck, that is a pretty regular feature of that they're, intersection. They're actually losing the taco truck. Okay. Now they're rerouting it. Right on. Yeah. Great concern. <laughs> well, if they blame me for <laughs> no, no, for no. the taco <laughs> truck. I think if I had to choose, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a toss-up. We've well, probably given you an idea. You can use a taco truck <laughs> yeah, in your next installation. Good. Yeah. And I'm going to guess, Donald, at some point over your career, you've dealt with people who have not been particular fans of your work. And I'm just curious as to, um, you know, what you, in, in terms of being a public artist, how would you want a public who may not necessarily see your vision or be enamored of your vision, how would you still like for them to interact with and appreciate the piece? Well, I, I always appreciate it if they don't try to bomb it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll tell you, I've only, there's only one piece I've done in my life that is roundly hated. And I think it's hated because they're well, I'm, I don't even want to talk about it, but, <laughs> but it, that's an unusual thing for me. Uh, my normal experience and something I've, I would say there's, there's two experiences. One, you make a piece and everybody, oh, that's so nice. And then it's the last you hear of it and nobody really notices it. Um, or if they do, I don't hear about it. The other is what I strive for, and that is pieces that really become important in people's lives. Um, there's, 
there's a piece I did uh, in San Antonio. They have something called the River Walk. That's a beautiful civic amenity that was built in the WPA in the 30s. And they decided to extend the river walk, and there was a point where it goes under I-35, a major highway, and they thought it was going to be dark and spooky there, and people would just turn around and go back the other way. And I made a school of fish that are, each fish is about seven feet long, and there's like a couple dozen of them, and they're hanging under the highway, and they light up at night, and, and they're beautiful. And turns out that there's a colony of bats that live under the highway. And these bats fly out at night. And every evening, people gather. And I mean a lot of people gather there to watch the bats fly out. And the bats fly out, and then the fish light up, and everybody applauds. <laughs> And then they go out to the cantina, you know. And that, for me, is wonderful. Uh, I have a friend who was in San Antonio recently, and he got there, and someone said, well, have you seen the Alamo? And he said, yeah, you know, I saw the Alamo. And they said, well, did you see the fish? <laughs> you know, it was the second question he was asked. 